Cappadocia. Confession, I was calling it Cappadocia for most of my life. You know how it is though. You rent a dress, a car, and a photographer for an hour, you jump in a hot air balloon, and you call yourself a world traveler. Listen, I suffer from a condition. I've had it my whole life. If everyone does something, I just gotta do something else. I travel to find authenticity in this world, to find myself in a moment, one that is unique to me. In the pursuit of this, I've never really had a house, and since there are tens of thousands of abandoned cave homes here, I thought the market might be cheap, but I needed to find the perfect one, one that wasn't part of a heritage site, one that hadn't been renovated into a luxury cave hotel, and one where I wouldn't see another tourist. One I could call my own, just for 24 hours. And then, I found it. Let's pick up the story by getting dropped off. <sighs> okay, crew. Let's go on an adventure. <laughs> this is a castle. Don't know why I'm being quiet. I don't think anyone's in here. Don't think so. You can see how it was carved with like a pickaxe. Every single one of those scratches. A crack of a pickaxe. These caves have quite a history, as you saw. This one's a dead end. And they're filled with secrets. And all of these you see on the side are shelves that people carved in. And these especially, these are really cool here. What do you think this is? They're like little hollow tunnels. See that? My hand goes right through. They're everywhere here. See, more here, everywhere, all of this. <laughs> this area was the stables where the former residents kept their livestock. All of these holes were carved here so they could tie up their animals for the night. This area of the world was famous for its horses, so much so that Cappadocia literally translates to land of the horses. Looks like there's three different floors. Let's continue the adventure upwards. I don't know, sometimes on these adventures, I feel like a little kid. And I definitely feel that way right now. Look at this giant stone arch. Cappadocia, out there. These hills are filled, are Swiss cheesed with these tunnels. And I wish I knew more about what happened in some of these places. This is like a mansion. I don't think I'll ever have a mansion. I like travel too much. This is probably the best thing I'm gonna get. But hell, I'll take it. Look, all of these carved out by some man or woman thousands of years ago. Living in a cave back in the day would have been really shitty. And when I mean shitty, I mean shitty because you're in here with your wildlife, they're crapping everywhere, your livestock, you're crapping in some hole in the corner, it's gonna be dark, you might have torchlight. I'm assuming here, look at this. This must have been a cave in right here. So we're overlooking the valley. And yeah, holy shit, look at this. This fell off. Crack right there. Boom. Oh, no, that's a toilet, right? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Cappadocia was mentioned in the Bible. And our best guess is that people have been living here and carving homes since the Bronze Age, between 3000 and 1200 BC. In 400 BC, Xenophon of Athens, the Greek military leader, philosopher, and historian, said this. Their houses were underground. This isn't a Greek accent. It just sounded funny when I said it in my normal voice. 
It's a quote. Bear with me. Houses with a mouth like that of a well, but below, they spread out widely. Entranceways were dug for the herd animals, but the people descended by ladder. In the houses, there were goats, sheep, cattle, birds, and their children, or something like that. So this place has been a wonder of the world since before Jesus Rice. And exploring around here, you'll see so much more than just homes. There are underground cities that housed up to 20,000 people, and many Christian monasteries and churches from a time long, long ago. From the front, or further away, it looks like there's three levels. We saw the bottom. It's where I think they kept the livestock. This is definitely where they lived. You can see these old fire pits. Actually, it's really amazing. You can see the, still see the ash from, or the soot from the, the fires of the past. They would have fires in these holes, I think, to keep the wind from blowing them out. There's a super sketchy path over there. Look at that tread. We'll just be careful. Ah, uh, it's in way back down. The thing about these, uh, these houses and fortresses is that they had the entrances hidden for the most part. I don't think this one specifically was used as a fortress, but some of them were, and they'd have hidden entryways. I mean, generally, you don't want to leave the door to your house unlocked. Uh, I mean, if you're living in a cave, I guess you can't really lock it. But you generally want to hide your front door. So maybe if we explore a bit, we can find the way to the top. Maybe. Let's keep looking. Not too bad of a climb compared to some of the other ones I did. I'm gonna find a good spot to camp. <laughs> How's that for a view? I have to show you something. See this right here? This is called tough and it's anything but. It's so brittle. So millions of years ago, volcanoes rain down inferno from the sky and basically that ash compressed. I don't know how many hundreds of meters of ash fell on this area, but now it's been reduced to this, this stone. And that's why it's so easy to carve. You have to be careful when you explore these places because they're always chipping off because what, look, literally fucking just styrofoam, guys. We're living in a styrofoam castle, but goddamn, it's pretty cool. Geology in general is really cool to a certain point when you know too much about geology and then it rapidly and exponentially becomes becomes less cool. <laughs> but if you know a lot or a little, just understanding this is ash, it's pretty damn incredible, isn't it? <laughs> All right, we've explored enough. Let's set up camp. All right. Looking pretty cozy. Oh, look at that. That makes me happy. It's gonna be nice tonight, especially after the sunsets. Okay. Night has fallen. It's food time. We have a nice big chunk of steak that's cut up into shish kebabs. I got some sticks, also some tin foil, and inside that tin foil, we got some potatoes. Might take a while for the potatoes, but we got time, don't we? It's looking good. But it's also very dark. Let me grab the light from the tent and give you guys a little bit of a recap. Not that big of a deal, but I did drop one entire shish kebab on the ground. And it's covered in rocks. Ah, dirt never hurt anybody, right? We get so scared about dirt. Like, we, th we think it's like poison now. Dirt's fine. Rocks, though, you know, might get crunchy. But that's okay. It looks really good. Another cool thing is, I could use the back of my knife and carve divots out of these stones so I could actually make little 
shish kebab rotational groups. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. We'll call them that. And so I'll be able to spin these right in the spot without fear of them rotating over and falling in the fire. Cool, right? Dinner? Maybe about 20 minutes, I think. Look, 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 look. They're ready. We got the moon in the back, fire in the front. Some delicious, delicious shish kebabs right there in the middle. I brought dessert. This is raki, the Turkish fire water. The poison, the local poison. It's supposed to be a lot like, maybe like ouzo from Greece or like zambuca. It's got that anise black licorice taste. I pour some in my flask already, wherever that is. But that's next. Look at it. What do you think? I've got some arts and crafts. Who wants to learn how to make a torch? It's easy. I'll show you. Here's what you need to make a torch. Number one, a wooden dowel or a stick. Number two, you need a piece of fabric, usually cotton. This is an old towel. A bottle of bitter lemon. This is actually kerosene. And always mark your kerosene with an X. X, X everywhere because someone might get thirsty. Maybe you when you're drunk or maybe one of your friends will be like, oh, I want some bitter lemon. They will be bitter and they might be dead. Some wire and also, some pliers. Okay, so the first thing you want to do, take your towel and just knife it. Right like that. Take our broken end of the dowel like this, and just wrap it as tight as we can. We're gonna make a wad at the end, like so. Try to stretch it and pull it so it's tight, 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 tight. We're gonna take one, one end like this, wrap it around as tight as we can with our hands but our hands aren't strong enough. So then we're gonna take the pliers, twist that over and over to get it nice and tight. And then you wrap, keep going, nice and tight. Great, just twist that thing on. And there we go. Let there be light. All right, kids, hey, don't play with fire unless you know what you're doing, especially things like kerosene. I was taught by an expert, and I know how to do it safely. Let's go. Wandering around these old rock walls is humbling. Thousands of years of humans were born here and died here. 50 generations. 50 lifetimes, just like my own. So much has happened here. It makes me feel like there must be something left behind in these walls. Is it all just empty stone now? Or is there some sort of presence still here? Some part of humanity that we can't quite put a finger on. I'm never quite sure. Let me know what you think in the comments. And right about now, is when you'd expect this adventure to go sideways, right? Based on previous experience, everything was going smoothly this time until I saw someone. Oh my God, guys, I had the scare of a lifetime. I'm taking these really nice long exposure shots at the campsite, and I look down and there's a man standing right by the entrance. It's me, it's my, uh, it's my shadow. <laughs> I almost shit a brick, oh my God. Anyway. Back to being deep. I come to these places to prove a point, I guess, that you don't always have to follow what's in the brochure. You really don't have to. The world is open, it's friendly, and people think that they, they'll come here and they'll get mugged or they won't understand the language or they won't be able to get around, but 
I mean, a lot of the same services like Airbnb and all this work in countries like this too. You can book flights and on Expedia. None of these companies pay me. I guess the point is just that you can come here and you can stay in a deluxe cave hotel. I don't know. I like this a lot more. You can create your own adventures, guys. You can show up, see something cool, and go check it out. Because for me, that's the one that makes me feel most alive. And isn't that the point? To feel alive? So I was cold alone all night. This tripod spent five hours down here doing a star lapse. I'm always happy to see that it's still there in the morning. No one's taken it yet. There are trees down there. Let's see if we can get some firewood. show's over and so is my coffee if you want to know exactly where this campsite is I have a map where I've pinned all the locations of the places I've made videos about my campsites as well as things like orange fights and the lost tribes I visited they're all on that big fearless and far location map all you do is just throw in your email into the link and you get it in your inbox and hey listen we had an important conversation last night about planning your own adventures. The world is yours. You can grab it by the cojones. And you can have these life-changing experiences yourself. You don't need tour guides and pamphlets and stuff like that. So remember, for me, I'm on the quest to find the most epic campsite in the world. This one's pretty cool, but just wait until the next one. It has potential. I can't wait to show you. Thanks for watching, guys. Chase your fears, and I'll see you in the next video here on Fearless and Far.